you're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is June 4th, 2021, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, bronchial and nasal challenges. These are from Middleton's Chapter 61. Our presenter is Dr. Mary Wynn. She's an allergy immunology fellow at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. All right. Uh, Good morning, everyone. Today is Friday, June 4th at 10 a.m. It's another beautiful day in Kansas City, Missouri, and thank you for joining us for Conferences for Online Allergy today. Today, we first have the pleasure of having Dr. Mary Wynn, one of our own fellows, who is going to be speaking with us today about Middleton's Chapter 61 over bronchial and nasal challenge testing. Thank you, Mary. Thanks, Jordan. All right, guys. Um, so there was a lot of information in this chapter, but I tried to underline and bold it the part that I thought would be important for boards. A lot of the stuff we're going over basically will only be used for research. So just an outline, we'll be talking about bronchial challenges, indirect airway hyperresponsiveness, non-selective challenges, and its clinical utility. Treatment monitoring, allergen challenge, other allergen challenge methods, occupational challenges, nasal challenge testing. So just to go over um, different um, categories of bronchial provocation tests, there is um, non-selective or selective is then categorized into direct, indirect, and then um, methicoline, exercise, and mental will fall into either direct or indirect. Selective, you have allergen, occupational sensitizer, as well as um, acetosalicylic acid, which is um, aspirin. So direct non-selective uh, challenges are stimuli that will have a direct effect via receptors on the airway smooth muscle, such as your methicoline or histamine. These challenges are typically done with methicoline, not histamine, and are um, the most widely performed diagnostically. They are typically done in a clinical setting of patients with symptoms that could indicate asthma but had a normal spirometry. Indirect non-selective or stimuli that act through an intermediate pathway, such as exercise, eucapnic voluntary hypercapnia, cold air, non-isotonic aerosols, and um, adenosine monophosphate mannitol. These challenges will depend on airway inflammation, and the responses correlate better with the number of airway inflammatory cells, particularly with eosinophils and metachromic metachromatic cells. Um, these tests are much higher, have much higher specificity, but lower sensitivity than the direct challenges. So selective allergen pro- bronchial provocation is mainly limited to research to study the pathogenesis of asthma and investigating new treatments. Um, selective occupational challenges with your low molecular weight sensitizers are helpful to assess subjects with possible occupational asthma, but should really be limited to specialized centers and um, with specialists who are familiar with this procedure. Um, The nasal mucosa is typically the site that is used to study for these challenges, mainly because it's the most common site of allergic inflammation. It's also very um, accessible, so making it an ideal site for study. And nasal provocations are very safe. Uh, nasal provocation can also be performed with many things like allergen, irritants, biochemicals, and physical stressors. And testing is typically done using allergen mixed in solution, sprayed, or dropped onto a nasal mucosa, either unilaterally or bilaterally. Um, bro- provocations can both be can be done both for the nose or the lower airway. And early phase responses typically occur within minutes of the direct mucosal exposure. And symptoms uh, and measure nasal obstruction can usually will peak at around 30 minutes. Your nasal congestion may persist for several hours, and you might have a biphasic response with a distinct late phase that's seen in a minority of patients. There are biomarkers for the nasal allergy challenges that can be measured using nasal fluid, nasal cytology, and mucosal biopsy specimen 
The products of mast cell degranulation will typically be um, increasing in the nasal fluid in the first hour after the provocation, and type 2 um, cytokines and chemokines typically increase around 2 to 3 hours and peaking at 6 to 8 hours. Nasal challenges can also be done to assess the efficacies and mechanisms of medications and forms a cornerstone of diagnosis of your local allergic rhinitis. Uh, nasal provocation testing has a role, may have a role in clinical practice, including in helping to diagnose occupational rhinitis and the di identification of local allergic rhinitis and um, selection of patients for um, AIT. So going more in uh, into more detail about bronchial challenges. So airway hyperresponsiveness from here on out, I will say AHR um, to exogenous demoi is a characteristic feature of asthma. The assessment of um, airway responsiveness with non-selective direct acting stimuli such as neurohistamine or methicoline can result in hyperresponsiveness defined as an increase in the magnitude and ease of induced bronchoconstriction. So, the increase of ma in the magnitude of bronchoconstriction is shown by the progressive elevation of the plateau response on the dose response curve. So, just basically, how quickly does it um, jump up, um, peak at? And then there's an increase in the ease of developing bronchoconstriction indicated by the leftward shift of the dose response curve and a smaller PD20 over PC20 or PC20. Um, so this is, I think, what would be relevant for us because it's used for methicoline dosing. Um, so PC20 or PD20 is the provocation dose that causes a 20% fall in FEV1. So that is, a, I think, important number to know because for methicoline challenge, how do you, um, what is used to determine a, a positive? Um, and then AHR is traditionally measured by PC20 or PD20 to reflect the leftward shift of the curve. So this image basically just showed the different level of um, AHR um, in response to the methicoline doses. And basically, the more leftward you go, meaning that there is a lower dose of methicoline Dose that is required to cause you to have a 20% fall in your FEV1. So that's why the purple line provides is, is the one that has um, marked AHR because it has the lowest dose of methicoline to cause the drop. Airway responsiveness is most commonly measured by inhalation provocation challenges to different agents, and um, those agents have the potential to produce bronchoconstriction in all asthmatics, but also in some patients with lung diseases and also some, um, some normal patients. Uh, direct non-selective agents trigger bronchoconstriction by acting directly on your airway smooth muscle receptors. And indirect stimuli, as we talked about earlier, goes through one me um, mediators from the inflammatory cells. And so this table kind just breaks down the different types of non-selective versus selective, um, direct versus indirect. Um, so as you can see, methicoline is under your direct non-selective. Um, exercise is under indirect non-selective, whereas aspirin is a selective non-immunologic. So just a little bit of history about histamine and methicoline challenge. Um, they are the most widely performed bronchial challenge tests due to historical reasons, cost, and availability. It actually was invented in um, France by a guy named Tiffano in 1940, who developed technology for measuring expiratory flow rates called FPV1. And um, he used this to measure bronchodilation following inhale isoprotein proteranol and bronchoconstriction following inhale acetylcholine, suggesting that these tests are helpful in the assessment of patients with lung disease. There are different methods for bronchoprovocation, um, and some it was really hard to compare one method to another. There was not a lot of standardization, so it is important to um, standardize these protocols and control bronchoprovocation provocation challenges so that we can get a reproducible dose of agonists and get reproducible data.
There's also progressive dosing regimen um, that were initially instituted as a matter of safety, but now it basically provides standardized dose delivery. In 2000, the American Thoracic Society, or ATS, published two um, protocols for these challenges. One was the two-minute tidal breathing method modified from a Dutch method, and um, another was five total lung capacity breath dosimeter method modified from a method described by the Quad AI. The results were expressed as um, PC20. Both methods were considered to be equivalent in um, multiple studies for patients who has mild to moderate or greater airway hyperresponsiveness, meaning a PC20 um, less than one to two microgram per mil. The dosimeter study with the deep inhalations to TLC follow-up by a breath hold did cause some bronchial protection in a substantial number of asthmatic with borderline or mild airway hyperresponsiveness, such as patients with PC22 to 16 mix per mil, resulting in more false negative studies. So the recommendation is that diagnostic method calling challenge be done without um, the um, TLC inhalations. And this just kind of goes over the data, comparing the two um, different methods, and um, they use basically different dosing um, for the methacholine challenges and what they classify as normal, borderline, mild, moderate, or marked. So then guidelines were updated in 2017. Um, because there was a difference in the concentration used, now it was recommended to just use a PD20 instead of the PC20, since the response to methacholine is dose and not concentration dependent. So the concentration required and inhalation time can be adjusted for the technical characteristics of the device. In addition, there was a large portion of weight loss during nebulization from a jet nebulizer through evaporation rather than nebulizate output. So the dose expressed should take into account the evaporative losses. Um, they still know um, that the TLC inhal deep TLC inhalation should be avoided. The time interval between the dose steps step up should be a constant of five minutes so that the partial cumulative effect is constant between methods. These changes help to um, allow for improved um, between standardization between method and uh, device comparisons. So provocation challenges in pediatric population can be done if the child is old enough to um, perform reproducible spirometry. And that's typically at round six, but as we know, that um, can be a little bit older depending on the patient. Data suggests that the cutoff point for defining AHR in children are the same as in adults. Recent uh, reviews suggested a methacholine PC20 of about three to four as giving the best sum of sensitivity and specificity. Um, airway responsiveness can also be measured in infants and children who cannot perform spirometry via auscultation, transcutaneous, can, transcutaneous PCO2, um, PCO2 um, expiratory flow rates, following a Force thor thoracal abdominal compression technique and airway resistance by force oscillation or um, plethysmograph. For direct bronchial challenge, the caveat to interpreting these test results include the fact that airway hyperresponsiveness can be variable from time to time, with um, can be increased with inflammatory stimuli and improved with environmental control, anti-inflammatory medication, or can be it could just improve spontaneously. The these variability is more common in a patient with recent onset of disease in children, so it's important that symptoms and exposures are current within the past few days prior to the test. Also in patients with resting airflow obstruction, such as COPD, this can make positive methacholine challenge difficult to interpret due to a pre-existing decrease in FEV1. Therefore, a normal spirometry is needed prior to the um, methacholine challenges. Um, third, medications can cause false negative challenges. Um, such as anticholinergic bronchodilators, oral medications that has an anticholinergic side effect, or um, functional antagonists such as inhaled beta-2 agonists, 
and these can inhibit airway response to methicoline. And then note that the severity of air, um, HA, AHR does not equate to the severity of asthma. And then patients with mild asthma or well-controlled asthma can result in false negative challenges. Um, for indirect airway challenges, um, as we talked about before, stimuli act through an intermediate pathway to cause bronchoconstriction, and um, it can be broken down into osmotic versus non-osmotic, cause, causing the release of mast cell mediators. So data has confirmed that indirect challenges are more specific for asthma severity and in differentiating asthma from chronic airway limitations than direct challenges. The indirect challenges are also better correlated with airway eosinophilia and improve more with anti-inflammatory therapy. And it has increased specificity, but then uh, it might increased specificity might be due to um, loss, dose limitations of many indirect stimuli. However, with the increased specificity, you also have a loss in diagnostic sensitivity. Um, due to the fact that it has high specificity and low sensitivity, um, indirect challenges is a nice complementary test to um, the highly sensitive direct challenges. And um, this chart is just mainly comparing the differences between direct and indirect. So um, one of the indirect airway um, hyper-responsiveness challenges is your exercise-induced test or exercise challenge. This has been widely used to um, identify and quantify the severity of, of exercise-induced bronchospasm. It's typically measured with a single relatively high-dose challenge of near-maximal exercise for about six minutes, typically done on a treadmill or um, psychoergometer with targeted heart rate in the range of 80 to 90 percent of the predict predicted maximum, so that's 220 minus your age or the patient's age. The subject should be breathing through the mouth with dry, cool air, and that's with less than 50% humidity and less than 25 degrees Celsius. FVV1 is measured before and at intervals after the exercise for about 30 minutes. However, the definition of a positive test is controversial. It has been defined between a range of 10 to 15% fall in FVV1. And because this is a single relatively high dose challenge with a potential for a large drop in FEV1, appropriate care must be taken and it should be done in a facility with um, a physician present. Um, eucapnic voluntary hypercapnia is also another indirect airway hyperresponsiveness test. It's a surrogate for exercise challenge for patients who cannot com um, complete the exercise challenge. It's typically done by having patients inhale dry air with 5% CO2 for six minutes, targeting a minute ventilation of 30 times the FEV1, so about 85% of calculated maximum voluntary ventilation. The FEV1 is measured before and at intervals after the challenge for up to 10 to 15 minutes. A 10% reduction in FEV1 is considered a positive challenge. The mechanism of bronchoconstriction is via osmotic challenge re related to the excessive drying of the airway mucosa. Results are similar to exercise challenge, but it's less expensive and require less sophisticated equipment, um, and it can be done in individuals who cannot perform the exercise challenge. Um, standardized cold air challenge is a modified version of the EVH challenge. It uses cold, dry air of negative 18 degrees Celsius and 0% humidity. The use of the cold air challenge allows, uh, makes it possible to perform an EVH challenge in a dose response fashion, but because of the, you know, significantly cold temperature the air has to be. It requires expensive and sophisticated equipment, to, um, but it does offer some limited advantages over the standard EVH. Um, using hypertonic saline, um, you can do, uh, this is the most common non-isotonic aerosol challenge used. Um, doubling dose challenge is done by inhaling 4.5% um, saline from a high output ultrasonic nebulizer for doubling amounts of time ranging from 0.5 to 8 minutes. 
And then the FEV1 is measured at time points similar to that of um, the other direct challenges. The mechanism of bronchoconstriction here is that of an osmotic effect similar to that of the exercise or EVH. Um, hypotonic saline can also be used for sputum induction in patients with asthma or pretreatment with a bronchodilator is um, recommended in these situation. Using adenosine um, as for challenges, it, this is typically more popular in Europe. Um, AMP results in non-osmotic release of mast cell mediators. The methods are similar to that of direct challenges, but the concentration used are different. Dry powder mannitol, um, it can also be used in indirect airway hyperresponsiveness. It is, mannitol is a, an isomer of sorbitol and is, natu is a naturally occurring sugar referred to as alcohol sugar. Dry powder mannitol provides an osmotic challenge to the airway mucosa and the proposed dosing is 0, 5, 10, 20, 40, 80, um, and then 160 times 3 to get a cumulative dose response curve ranging from 0 to 635 milligram. The interval between dosing should be 2 minutes so that the entire challenge lasts about 20 to 25 minutes. Positive challenges defined as 15% fall in FEV1, measure one minute after each dose, and a PD-15 greater than 635 is considered to be normal. The results of mannitol challenges has been correlated pretty well with other indirect stimuli. Um, it has less dose limitations, so the increased sensitivity compared to, and has increased in sensitivity compared to other indirect stimuli. Um, and then other indirect challenges that um, are available include the propranolol challenge, which um, uses relatively high concentrations of propranolol inhale to induce bronchoconstriction by blocking the beta adrenergic receptor on the smooth muscle and unmasking the um, cholinergic tone. These challenges can have improved diagnostic specificity compared with the histamine challenge in differentiating asthma from chronic airway limitation. Other indirect challenges, uh, other indirect agents include tachykinins, bradykinin, um, metabisulfite, and um, SO2. So what is the clinical utility of this? Um, Non-selective challenges are widely recommended as diagnostic tests for asthma in patients with symptoms but has normal resting expiratory flow rates. Direct challenges are most widely used and are highly sensitive if symptoms are current, so giving you a very high negative predictive value, indicating that a negative challenge should rule out clinically current asthma with reasonable certainty. False negative methacholine challenge can occur in um, the following cases. So your elite or high intensity athletes, um, if someone is taking medications of with bronchodilation, um, bronchodilating effect and did not report that, um, if patients had no current or exposures or symptoms prior to the, the challenge, and if um, they were in doing um, TLC breathing or breath hold methods. Although a negative challenge strongly suggests absence of current asthma, a positive challenge is not diagnostic of asthma. Positive challenges indicate that there's just airway dysfunction. Um, the false positive challenges occur about 5 to 15 percent of the normal population and 20 to 40 percent of patients with rhinitis and in patients with mild, latent, or subclinical asthma. The positive predictive value of histamine PC20 below 8 mg per mil is less than 50 percent in a random population. The positive predictive value, however, can be improved in patients if you have high suspicion of disease based on symptoms. Um, symptoms mimic the and the symptoms mimic the natural occurring symptoms that patient will refer for. Um, positive methacholine challenges do not predict the responses the response to asthma therapy in subjects presenting with isolated cough and normal lung function. The indirect challenges are highly specific but are not sensitive. A specific challenge is of value in confirming a diagnosis of asthma and, is, and of limited effect in excluding the diagnosis of asthma. 
the indirect challenges that are especially um, valuable to evaluate for is the EI, um, is EIB. Using non-selective challenges for evaluation of occupational asthma. Um, non-selective challenges have been used to provide indirect evidence of exposure to the sensitizing agents. Low and high molecular weight al allergens can cause marked increases in airway responsiveness with little change to baseline airway caliber. Environmental control, especially early on in the disease, can cause a um, can lead to marked improvement. Large changes without um, explanation can infer exposure to a sensitizer. Using serial measurements of airway responsiveness, both at work and when away from work, can be helpful in diagnosing occupational asthma. Um, there are several, uh, we kind of talked about it briefly, but, you know, many medica medications can cause um, negative or false negative responses to these challenges. So there are acute effects of drugs on airway responsiveness. Testing relates primarily to bronchodilators. So inhale um, beta-2 agonists are excellent functional antagonists and um, inhibit all challenges for the duration of the activity. So therefore, short-acting beta agonists should be held about six to eight hours prior to the challenge, and long-acting beta agonists should be held 24 hours prior to the challenge. Specific agonists, such as anticholinergic and antihistamine, can also alter the results. Epitropium should be held for at least eight hours, and long-acting antimuscarinics, such as teotropium, for about at least a week. Theophylin has minor antagonistic effect, um, ICS in a single dose does not influence bronchial pro provocation, but um, long-term use can. Leukotriene receptor antagonists and inhaled chromaline in single doses does not, do not um, inhibit direct bronchoconstriction, but can affect indirect bronchoconstriction. Treatment monitor, um, using these challenges for treatment monitoring. So prolonged use of predominantly anti-inflammatory medications will improve airway responsiveness in both direct and indirect challenges, but it's more pronounced with the indirect challenges. Studies have suggested that direct and indirect markers of airway inflammation can be valuable for monitoring subjects with clinical asthma and help guide therapy. Indirect airway responsiveness is much more responsive to anti-inflammatory asthma therapy and this can be a potential therapeutic goal, as well as a tool to help predict which patients can or cannot successfully taper ICS. Um, using uh, treatment monitoring as prognosis, so there's a correlation between AHR in infancy and childhood and the persistence and severity of asthma in later years. AHR can also be um, a marker in individuals who are destined to have more trouble, um, more troublesome asthma. So now we'll move on to allergen challenge. Um, just some background information. Uh, atopic IgE-mediated airway reactions to inhaled protein-containing allergens is the most important factor in the pathogenesis of asthma. Bronchial provocation challenges using allergen aerosols are the most widely performed of the selective challenges. In the late 1900s, um, a physician named Blackley demonstrated that pollen was a cause of allergic rhinitis and asthma using challenge tests with whole pollen. Um, allergen challenges can um, reveal early allergen responses. So typical allergen-induced early asthmatic response after allergen challenges about it's maximum at 10 to 20 minutes and typically resolves spontaneously by two to three hours. The clinical correlate of bronchial provocation allergen induced um, early asthmatic response is clinical symptoms, wheezing, chest tightness occurring immediately after exposure to the inhaled allergen. So this table over here basically just shows that when um, the subject was exposed to guinea pig here, they had a drop in FEV1 um, pretty quickly. And you can see here that was like within 30 minutes of the exposure compared to the control with saline. Um, early asthmatic responses and its pharmacology are similar to those of non-selective indirect challenges. So this is just comparing the chart with 
you know, medications and how it can affect the test. Um, Allergen-induced al dual asthmatic responses is, is shown here, kind of talking about a, an early phase response as well as a late phase response. The late asthmatic response is an episode of airway obstruction of that appears following spontaneous resolution of your um, EAR. Your late response generally appears about four to five hours after allergen exposure and can persist for 12 or more hours. Studies confirm that your late phase response is also IgE-mediated. Pathophysiology involves air flow obstruction that can be reversed or prevented by inhale beta-2 agonists. Uh, airway responsiveness to histamine and methacholine increase between seven hours to several days following allergen exposure. So um, after the allergen exposure, exposure, patients have um, increased airway hyperresponsiveness, and that was um, demonstrated by the methacholine challenges. Increase in bronchoalveolar eosinophils after allergen um, challenge um, can occur. Um, this, was incre this increase was seen in subjects with um, delayed asthmatic response, but not isolated um, early asthmatic response. Late sequela following allergen challenge includes increased um, airway hyperresponsiveness, increased airway eosinophils and metachromatic cells, and this can be inhibited by corticosteroids. Um, speculation is that airway inflammation is the cause of late asthmatic response and the increased um, AHR. Um, the late sequela, uh, rather than the EAR in isolation, resembles your clinical asthmatic picture. Using standard allergen challenge method, the measurement of the entire um, dual asthmatic response, allergen response, requires about three to four days. The Dillowin inhalation control day is typically recommended. The allergen Dillowin is inhaled at 10 to 15 minute interval on three occasions. The allergen solutions are prepared in doubling dilution starting with 1 to 8 from the stock solution and diluted to 1 to 10, um, 1,024 or more um, as required by the patient. Spirometry is then typically measured before and serially for 7 hours. The allergen PC20 can be predicted to within 2 to 3 doubling concentrations from airway responsiveness to histamine or methacholine and the skin tests then um, endpoint to the allergen. The allergen PC20 can be predicted, um, wait, sorry, I talked about that already. Allergen challenges can safely be started three to four concentrations below the predicted allergen PC20, and allergen inhalation can cause um, systemic allergic reactions and severe and prolonged airways responsive responses. So a physician should be in attendance and medication should be available for possible reactions. The allergen inhale is inhaled by tidal breathing or by dosimeter. The spirometry is measured at baseline and 10 minutes after each inhalation until a, 10, a 15 to 20 percent fall in FEV1 is achieved. FEV1 is then measured every 10 minutes for the first hour and then hourly up to seven hours after allergen exposure. Most protocols now incorporate direct sputum eosinophils and indirect airway responsiveness or ENO measurements of airway inflammation done 24 hours before and after the allergen, uh, allergen challenge. The early um, asthmatic response is recorded as the maximum percent fall in FEV1 in the first two hours and the late asthmatic response as the maximum percent fall in FEV1 between three to eight hours. Um, there are other allergen challenge methods available, such as the early asthmatic response model, the repeat low-dose allergen challenge model, and segmental bronchi bronchoscopy allergen challenge model. So the allergen-induced EAR model is done similarly as the histamine or methacholine challenge. Doubling doses are administered at 12 to 15 minutes interval until you get a 15 or 20% fall in FEV1. Following measurement of allergen PC20, a single dose of steroid or ICS is given to prevent um, late asthmatic response. The advantage of this model is that many patients will 
um, with positive allergen challenge don't have, have um, a late asthmatic response, so more will be able to participate in this model. Many subjects will have milder or stable asthma and um, would be more suitable for the, measure, the serial measurements. Again, subjects with positive allergen challenge don't um, do not have a late asthmatic response, so more will be able to participate in this. Many subjects that have mild or stable asthma would be more suitable, and there's the ability to provide better discrimination between pharmaceutical agents that markedly inhibit the early asthmatic response. A disadvantage uh, um, of this model is that it fails to account for low dose allergen challenge. Um, this, these challenges use aqueous extracts that don't really um, mimic natural exposure intended to patients exposed to a relatively high concentration of already solubilized allergen for a short period of time. So the low dose allergen challenge involves using sub early as um, asthmatic response inducing allergen doses, but given repeatedly daily for five days, re resulting in induction of airway hyperresponsiveness and airway inflammation without significant changes in their airway caliber, so that this can be closely mimicking the natural exposure to allergen. Um, segmental bronchoscopically administered allergen challenge this protocol has been used primarily in research to investigate the pathogenesis of asthma. It is invasive, um, and this protocol permits administration of a pretty high dose of allergen locally. It also allows for direct sampling of the bronchial secretion of cells, mediators, and cytokines. The pharmacologic um, inhibition of allergen-induced responses. Using inhaled beta agonists administered prior to allergen, this can block the EAR and can affect mast cell mediator release, but it doesn't have any effect on your late phase. It can potentially give um, a larger dose of allergen, and if not treated or prevented, your late phase can become quite severe. Your LABA has a prolonged duration and can typically mask your late responses and increases airway responsiveness. A single dose of steroid, as we talked about before, given before or after EAR will block the late response and other late sequela, but doesn't inhibit their early response. Regular use of ICS does provide a modest improvement of EAR. Chromaline used prior to allergen challenge will inhibit all aspects of the challenge. Theophylline is, um, can partially inhibit the EAR and the LAR. Your like leukotriene receptor antagonist significantly inhibits all aspects of the allergen-induced airway response. And antihistamine provides some inhibition of EAR and LAR. The responses um, can be additive and possibly synergistic with your um, leukotriene receptor antagonists. So now we'll move on to talking about occupational challenges. Um, these are typically used um, to help diagnose occupational asthma, which is typically caused by an agent found in the workplace. Agents are differentiated into high molecular weight, IgE simulating protein containing allergens, and low molecular sensitizers. Occupational challenges with low molecular weight sensitizers are the same as al the four allergen challenges. Isolated late asthmatic responses are more common with occupational low molecular weight sensitizers. It requires prolonged challenge procedure to avoid unexpected and severe late asthmatic response. The challenge can take as long as five days and should only be performed in centers with physicians who have um, expertise in this area. Occupational challenges otherwise is pretty similar to your allergen challenges. Um, you would want to monitor the airway for about seven hours after each exposure, performance of methicoline tests after each exposure, and evaluate for airway inflammation. Um, directive, direct non-selective bron bronchial provocation using methicoline is the most widely performed inhalation challenge. Test has, um, this test has a high diagnostic sensitivity for asthma. 
um, it functions best to exclude asthma when the results are negative and positive tests provide documentation of airway dysfunction. Um, like we talked about earlier, the caveat is that symptoms have to be current and um, patient has to have normal baseline spirometry. Uh, commonly used challenges involves your osmotic versus non-osmotic um, mast cell mediator release. Um, these challenges have increased diagnostic specificity and reduced diagnostic sensitivity and useful to confirm a diagnosis of asthma. Um, EVH is the current indirect challenge of choice because of its relative ease regarding equipment requirements. Um, there are little of any clinical usefulness in the routine management or follow-up of asthma using um, allergen challenges. Allergen challenges um, can be used to determine the clinical relevance of various allergens, um, such as information can, this information can already be gained from skin testing. Um, patients needing the challenge are unlikely to be well enough to undergo the protocol without um, having to take medications that can inhibit their response. And there are just, you know, safer or less invasive procedures that can help predict the early asthmatic response rather than using the allergen challenge. Potential indications for using allergen challenge may include patients who can benefit from a cause and effect relationship to a particular allergen or patients who cannot undergo skin testing. Um, so that's kind of as if like a patient who ha might have a allergic response to dogs and you're trying to convince somebody to get rid of their dog. That's kind of what the um, Middletons were suggesting. The most common selective challenge performed is your um, allergen, um, your occupational challenge. It takes about three to four days will call capture complete airway response to allergen and it's mainly used for um, research so that's why we don't really see these allergen inhalation challenges. As far as occupational challenges go, um, inhalation challenge with occupational allergen is the only way to confirm sensitization to low molecular weight agent encountered in the occupational setting. These procedures are quite complex and time consuming and um, should only be performed at a specialized center. Okay, I think we're approaching the end. Uh, so these, now we'll move on to nasal challenge testing. Uh, nasal challenges um, can be used, can be done using um, allergens, irritants, chemicals, and physical stressors to help elicit responses within the nose. The procedure is safe and has very low risk for inducing systemic allergic reactions or bronchospasms. Has great sensitivity to detect treatment effects than assessment of seasonal symptoms alone. It may be helpful in the diagnosis of occupational rhinitis and or identification of local allergic rhinitis and selection of patients for AIT. So the typical immediate symptoms that um, includes itching, sneezing, rhinorrhea, nasal congestion, and these are due to increases in granular secretion, plasma, extravasation, and mast cell and basal granulation. Later and more prolonged symptoms of nasal congestion and mucosal hyperreactivity begin 3 to 11 hours after the exposure due to the influx of eosinophils, basophils, and neutrophils and increase in type 2 um, cytokines within the nasal lining fluid. It can be helpful to assess clinical relevance of IG sensitization seen on skin or serum testing or um, to, identification, to identify the most relevant allergen when considering AIT. The contraindications for doing nasal challenges includes patients with nasal polyps, septal deviation, sinusitis, concurrent chorizal illness, use of beta blockers, active nasal bleeding, history of anaphylaxis or significant angioedema attributable to um, provoking agent. The caution should be done, um, held in patients with poorly controlled asthma. These challenges can be done with either single center dosing or dose titration. Um, the for nasal challenge testing, there are different types um, of applicators that can be used for allergen application. Um, it's typically done with a single allergen. Purified allergen extract is dissolved in a non-irritant aqueous diluent. 
Nasal spray dose applicator device is used to deliver fixed volume per actuation, and um, the risk of failed or incomplete spray um, does exist. Bil filter disc in pregnant with allergen can be applied to nasal mucosa. Um, nasal lavage can then be done to collect um, fluid and cells for analysis, um, and it's unlikely to have a significant irritant effect on the nasal mucosa. Cotton wool has been replaced by synthetic disc or strips and open cell polyurethane sponges for direct collect of nasal lining fluid. And this just kind of goes over the different methods for sample collection. And um, nasal challenge testing can provide um, provides control temperature, humidity, and particular particulate allergen exposure at less comparable to natural exposure when using environmental exposure chambers. Um, these are highly reproducible tests with good correlation shown with symptoms elicited during natural seasonal exposure, but the equipment are quite expensive and large and it's not readily available. Symptoms um, can be divided into itch, running, sneezing, and blockage after these nasal challenge testing. And they typically range from zero for no symptoms to three for severe symptoms. The early phase symptoms are defined as the um, occurring within the first three to 60 minutes with immediate sneezing and then nasal obstruction and rhinorrhea peaking between five to 30 minutes. The late phase responses typically just include your sustained nasal congestion. Um, measures of nasal airway patency can be done to um, see what the responses are towards nasal challenge testing. Um, the, these measurements are not standardized. Peak nasal inspiratory flow, or PNIF, uses modified Yoltine peak flow meter, and the value is, depend is dependent on lung capacity and nasal patency. Or you can do a rhino manometry, which is the measurement of pressure within the nasal passages. It describes a recording of airway pressure and flow during normal breathing, and it's used to calculate airway resistance and conductance. Or another method would be to use acoustic rhinometry um, used to measure the cross-sectional area of the airway as a function of distance into the airway. The biomarkers that can be seen within the nasal fluid collected, um, markers of early phase responses include mast cells and basophil degranulation, granular secretion, and plasma exudation. It results in histamine and tryptase increases rapidly peaking at 5 to 10 minutes. Prostaglandin D2 is also raised and is a good marker for mast cell degranulation with histamine. Cystinol leukotriene have also been found to be elevated predominantly in the EPR and is a marker of EPR. Markers of late phase response includes your cytokine and chemokine secretion and markers of eosinophil activation. Um, nasal cytology can also be obtained by lavage, nasal brushing, or scraping. Nasal scrapes and curatage allow small cellular samples to be taken repeatedly from the inferior terminate for studies. Nasal mucosal biopsy can also be taken from the inferior terminate under local anesthetic and topical vasoconstrictor. This procedure is pretty well tolerated um, for studies. Um, neuronal responses can also be measured for um, after a nasal challenge testing. This um, helps to describe the effect of ipsilateral nasal provocation on the contralateral nasal mucosa. There is a um, neurogenic reflex arc that exists in our nose. Um, it involves histamine simulation of ipsilateral afferent sensory neurons and contralateral muscarinic efferent supplies glands. So unilateral nasal provocation can induce not only contralateral nasal symptoms, but bilateral eye symptoms as well. Nasal provocation increases histamine and substance P in tear fluid. Um, eye symptoms could be blocked by nasal administration of H1 antihistamine or ICS um, because of this neurogenic reflex arc.
Um, talking about mucosal priming and repeat nasal challenges, um, the thought is that persistent allergen exposure during the pollen season is accepted to have a priming effect on the mucosa, and repeat challenges can mimic this priming effect. Um, for local allergic rhinitis, this is a uh, local IgE synthesis um, in allergic rhinitis to cause symptoms. Patients will have typical allergic rhinitis symptoms on natural allergen exposure, but there is a lack of evidence of systemic allergen sensitization, but respond positively to nasal challenges with the relevant allergen. Allergen-specific IgE may be detected in their nasal fluid. Patients with local allergic rhinitis may respond to immunotherapy. Biochemical triggers such as histamine, methacholine, AMP, used as tests for nonspecific nasal mucosa hyperreactivity can be done. Histamine provocation recreates the early phase symptoms of allergen provocation. Methacholine only has an ipsilateral effect and has direct effects on the mucosa. Your AMP has an indirect effect. Nasal capsaicin spray as a treatment can be can be used as a treatment for patients with non-allergic, non-inflammatory rhinitis, and physical triggers um, such as cold, dry air and hyperosmolar solutions can also um, be used for nasal challenges. And um, Lastly, the nasal aspirin provocation test can also be done. This uses solubilized lysine aspirin or Ketorolac to identify patients with aspirin-exacerbated respiratory disease or AERD, particularly in patients with nasal polyposis. Um, the advantage of doing this over oral or bronchial challenge is the increased safety without compromising sensitivity. The positive response is based, is based on acoustic rhinometry or peak nasal inspiratory flow. So limitations of nasal provocation testing is just that it's an imperfect approximation of real life exposures. So. Um, just a couple of slides to summarize what we talked about, because I know we talked about a lot. Non-selective direct challenges are highly sensitive and function best to exclude asthma with reasonable certainty when the test is negative and the symptoms in questions are clinically current. The three most important caveats for interpreting challenges are avoidance of deep total lung capacity breathing during methacholine inhalation, requirement of a normal expiratory flow rate, and requirement for suspicious symptoms to be clinically current. Non-selective indirect challenges are more specific and less sensitive for asthma and function best to confirm the diagnosis. Indirect challenges are a challenge of choice where exercise-induced bronchoconstriction is the question. Allergen challenges are primarily limited to research. Nasal provocation testing is used to investigate the pathophysiology of rhinitis, assess the efficacy of treatments, and improve clinical diagnosis. Provocation outcomes can include um, patient symptom score, measures of nas nasal airflow and resistance, glandular secretion volume, cellular influx, mucosal transcriptome expression, nasal fluid biomarker levels, and peripheral blood immune cells. Provocations using biochemical, physical, and irritant stimuli are important in understanding the nasal physiology, identifying the effects of environmental exposure, and in assessing mucosal hyperreactivity. Um, that's all I have. Thanks for listening. I know it's super dry. I kind of went over this chapter with Dr. Salzman about the methacholine challenge, and I think the biggest thing to remember for boards is that the um, PD-20 if you get a positive test, it doesn't say the patient has asthma. If you get a negative test, it pretty much rules out the fact that that patient has any acute um, asthma at that time. Um, well, that's all I have, guys.